D announced an absolute shed load of changes coming to Warframe this October, and there is just so much to process it's almost overwhelming. Now, as this is all pre-release information and subject to change, rather than do a super deep dive into the mechanics that we can't even access yet, I'm going to break down the five dev workshops they posted all in this one video. The other details covered on the live stream I'll review when they actually reach the game. So for now, strap in, strap on. Yes, that really happened. I'm Nick Engineer. Let's solve a practical problem. The five workshops posted were roughly categorized as new player path improvement, system changes in general quality of life, hydroid rework, companion improvements, and then accessibility and HUD improvements. I'm going to start with the most veteran focused changes and work down to the more new player oriented details. Most veteran of all, receiving a huge cheer at Tenacon are the changes to Hydroid. If you've been living under a rock or just recently joined Warframe, you may not be aware of just how dated current Hydroid is. Two of his abilities require you to hold Castum to charge up to full power, and both of those make actually shooting enemies a pain. Hydroid also currently has a puddle form, which is slow moving, minimally threatening, and just too unhelpful in most scenarios. Well, new Hydroid is going to retain much of his core aesthetic, while bringing the abilities much more in line with modern expectations. Firstly, all of his abilities are moving away from seemingly random damage types, including impact of magnetic, to a single focus on corrosive, with corrosive status effects. This basically takes the design of Corroding Barrage and makes it his core focus. In light of that, Corroding Barrage is being reworked to Viral Tempest, applying Viral procs with the augment as corrosive will be innate to Hydroid's abilities. To further support this corrosive focus, Hydroid's passive is completely new. The old slam for a chance that a tentacle is gone, replaced with cursing enemies he attacks. Any enemy hurt by Hydroid will suffer enhanced effects from corrosive procs, with the first proc removing 50% armor instead of 26%, rising to full stacks granting total armor strip, rather than a normal 80%. This will apply regardless of the source of corrosive procs, so long as Hydroid damaged the enemy in some way just once. This is an unusual but welcome approach to adding armor strip to Hydroid. You can focus on maximum range and minimum damage to still curse enemies, or even just fully focus on corrosive type weapons to sunder enemy armor in no time at all. As for Hydroid's active abilities, most of them are staying close to their current form. Tempest Barrage, his one and subsume option, will still be a damaging rain. It changes from impact to corrosive, from ragdoll to stagger, and from charge cast to tap cast for full power. This all makes it quicker to use, easier to use, and more effective at making enemies vulnerable to you and your allies. Hydroids 2, Tidal Surge, will still be a fast moving wall of water. It'll no longer scale the speed with casting stats, instead just being quick by default. He also gains some movement control during the ability, and enemies struck by it will be gathered up more conveniently rather than flung in random directions. Just like with Tempest Barrage, Tidal Surge is switching to a corrosive focus, further leaving enemies vulnerable at the end of the surge. One final change is to bring some of the power out from its augment into the ability itself, granting Hydroid a status cleanse effect on himself on cast. The augment is still required if you want to do that for allies. Both of these two abilities are focused on debuffing the enemies, making them very vulnerable, especially if they're armoured. That's where Hydroid's 3 comes in to handle the opposite, supporting Hydroid himself. The puddle is gone, replaced with the new ability Plunder. This will turn corrosive procs into a permanent armour removal on affected enemies, bypassing the duration on corrosive procs. On top of this, Hydroid will gain both armour and a corrosive damage bonus based on the enemies affected, similar to Atlas's armour from Rubble or Wukong's armour from Defy. This one I think could be one of the more unusual choices. I would expect enemies to normally be killed before the corrosive procs wear off on them, certainly if they're in a position to get plundered. Likewise, the armour bonus is strange given Hydroid's focus on shields for defence, but it does open up the option to tank with health rather than just shields and crowd control. As for the corrosive damage buff, a direct damage buff is almost always a win. Finally, Hydroid's 4 is remaining almost unchanged. The damage type is shifting to corrosive, and instead of swinging enemies everywhere, it'll instead hold enemies in place for easier kills. This is closer in nature to Vorman's 4th ability, but still, suspending enemies, reducing their armour, and letting you handle that at your leisure. Overall, Hydroid is changing very little in his theme, but his role has shifted from almost entirely crowd control to a combo of control and debuffing enemies, with a side of tank and self buff 
that helps him stay relevant, especially in more mobile missions. This does look like a good set of changes to bring up his relevancy without completely erasing who he has been historically in Warframe. In short, it looks great. Okay, on to the second workshop, the system changes and quality of life. This will be more relevant mostly to older players, but newer players will absolutely benefit hugely from the details in here. Firstly, and very simply, focus lenses are being buffed. Every lens will be nearly twice as powerful as before for generating focus, and convergence orbs will also grant 5,000 focus immediately on pickup to ensure you never get a zero. This just improves the gains when not actively focus or circuit farming. Next, Nightwave is getting its regular health check and refresh. We don't yet have a date on when it will change to a new series, but when the next Nightwave series launches, it's going to have some new stuff. The headliner is the addition of permanent weekly acts. Permanent as in they'll be the same three acts every week, designed to be something we just do as a matter of course. This means an extra 13,500 standing a week if you do them weekly, but they're also not eligible for catch-up if you skip weeks of gameplay. On top of this change, a whole bunch of acts will be removed in the next Nightwave series. A handful turn from daily to weekly, with plus size requirements, and a batch of Daviri related acts introduced. Sooner than that, however, the Abyss of Dagath update will see a selection of Nightwave acts reduced in length or difficulty to better balance them out and I am absolutely in favour of a lot of these alterations. Some key ones that jump out include reducing the plane's bounties needed, down from 5 to 3, the syndicate missions needed down from 10 to 5, which means you could do it all in one day, and the sabotage caches challenge, going from finding all three caches three times over to just finding any six caches during the week. I see Nightwave as inspiration to go do content you may not always be doing, or to refresh your memory on options you may have forgotten existed, or as a new player, never been introduced to. For challenges like the bounties, once you've done three, you'll have got the message and certainly decided if you're interested in continuing of your own accord. Likewise the caches, doing six caches, knowing that you can do it in two missions with a thorough search, is enough to introduce or reintroduce players to that. Again, some great changes to remove friction in the system, so on the whole, this looks positive for Nightwave. I will say though, I am surprised at the removal of the Allard V Secret Lab and Silver Grove challenges. I know a number of people who only learned about the labs thanks to these challenges, and I'm sure plenty forget the Silver Grove exists. Below that section, however, is a change that is rather more crunchy. Player shields are being reworked somewhat to account for the changes in the meta that have been established. Basically, shields are too weak, and we're often incentivized to run fewer shields for more survival, which you have to admit is rather backwards. Change number one, shields are stronger, literally. Their innate damage resistance is climbing from 25% to 50%, which is a 50% effective hit point buff. If something would need to do 100 damage to break your shields before, it'll now take 150 damage. Further to this, they're buffing some shield related mods involving shield recharge. Previously, these have been very niche, but now may well be worth a look. Fast Deflection and Vigilante Vigor are gaining a reduction to shield recharge delay of minus 45% and minus 30% respectively. If these two values add together, that'd be a 75% reduction in shield recharge delay. I don't know if they'll add or multiply yet, but if they do, that means your shields will begin recharging in just one quarter of a second after taking damage, or one second if the damage brought your shields to zero. That can be a lot of regeneration power, allowing for some genuine shield tanking ability. As for Fortitude, it's getting a buff to the shield recharge rate it offers, but more important is the boost to its knockdown resistance, rising from 20% to 40%. With this change, it can be combined with just one other mod, Surefooted, to provide total knockdown immunity. The budget form of Prime Surefooted has become even easier to implement, which can definitely be a boost for players who've been here less than a year. Now this is where the simple buffs end, and we start getting into the potentially controversial. I'm going to preface it by saying that I like these changes, but let's carry on. Shield gating is being adjusted to no longer be one of two fixed values. In case you missed it, the shield gating mechanic means that when your shields reach zero, you become immune to further damage other than toxin until your shield gate expires. Currently, that's a 1.3 second shield gate if you reach full shield since your last shield gate usage, or 0.3 seconds if you did not. The change is to make that duration scale based on what peak amount of shields you reached. 350 shields will grant 1.3 seconds, with lower shields granting a shorter time, down to 0.3, 
and higher shields granting a longer time, up to a max of 2.5 seconds at 1150 shields. Furthermore, partial shields will no longer have a fixed 0.3 second cap neither. If you regenerate your shield, but only partially, you'll get a shield gate based on the maximum you reached. This addresses a big issue in the current shield gate mechanics, where more shield max meant a longer time to reach maximum, therefore a longer time to get your full shield gate back. That's before even getting into brief respite shenanigans. Now, a higher shield capacity will both mean a larger maximum shield gate and faster shield gate recovery. One thing that's not been mentioned in the workshop so far is the impact of overshields. I don't know yet if they'll have an effect, so I'm waiting to see if DE will respond and clarify on that. It'd be cool if overshields counted, but also understandable if they don't. So far, this gives us shields that tank harder than before, resisting damage as if they have 300 armor at all times, and then a sensibly scaling shield gate based on maximum achieved hit points, rather than the binary system of max shields or not max shields. This does also mean that the decaying dragon key method of shield gating has been nerfed. Despite that, D still took another swing at it to ensure the dragon keys are not used as a tool to make you stronger. With it equipped, the decaying dragon key will both reduce your shield hit points and set your shield gate to a fixed 0.3 seconds, the lowest it can get. However, they're not blind to the number of players and builds enjoying a low shield shield gate with brief respite and auger mods involved. To that end, a new mod is being introduced, catalyzing shields. This will reduce your maximum shield capacity to roughly what it is today with a decaying dragon key, and loosely replicates today's shield gating mechanics. I say loosely because while you get a 0.3 second shield gate on one shield hit point and 1.3 seconds on full shield, the mod will also grant you a middle ground shield gate based on the proportion of shields restored compared to your maximum. It comes at the cost of a deep polarity mod slot rather than a slot free dragon key, but if you want to shield gate tank with minimum shields, then it is still possible post update. This also has the added benefit of not accidentally leaving on a debuff on the wrong Warframe builds, or respectively forgetting to apply the debuff before taking your minimum shield build into a mission. Overall, these are good changes to shields. They're more resilient, the shield gate timer scales, it's no longer a nerve to have more shield hit points, and basic sanity has been restored. Speaking of sanity, that's exactly what the next section brings. I'm fairly certain everyone in Warframe has been tripped up by the Warframe math at some point regarding hit points. The plus 440% mods of Vitality and Redirection don't actually seem to increase your hit points to over 5 times their values, and that's due to level bonuses being additive with those mods. DE have taken the time to address this confusion and overhaul the level bonuses to now be multiplicative with mods rather than additive. A plus 100% bonus to your health will actually double your health, not merely use the unleveled value. I say plus 100% because D have also used this opportunity to standardize all the health, shield, armor, and energy mods for Warframes, Arcwings, Necromechs, and Companions. All Warframe, Arcwing, and Necromech mods for those stats will be plus 100%. All Independent Companion mods will be plus 250%, and all Link Companion mods will be plus 125%. This standardization also comes with an adjustment to hit points to ensure the final values are where they should be. Most notably ensuring Warframes, Arcwings and Necromechs end up at about the same health and shield values as before the Sanity Pass when using these mods. That pass however is not without actual mechanical changes. In order to keep the math the same for fully ranked gear using a maxed out mod, every single Warframe now has higher health and shields when not using the mods Vitality and Redirection. All Warframes apart from Inoros are getting around 23% more health at rank 30, and most Shielded Frames are getting around 23% more shields at rank 30. Inoros however is only getting 8% extra health without Vitality. The Shield Increase is probably why the Catalyzing Shields mod drops your shields to 20% rather than 25% to account for the difference. More significant is that Nidus, Lavos and Kalevo are getting buffs to their armor, perhaps accounting for their inability to use mods to gain shields. Using Vitality and Steel Fiber, or their Umbral variants, Kalevo will gain 22-30% to effective hit points, Lavos 12-16%, to and Nidus 11-16%, to depending on how many mods are in use. Inaros, however, seems to be tanky enough as he's getting no such bonus to his overall tank. Similar has happened with Maximum Energy. While DE have aimed to keep Maximum Energy with Flow and Prime Flow within a couple percentage points of before, 
except for Garuda who got a buff, the unmodded energy of most Warframes is now higher. In fact, over half of them have 16% or more max energy when not modded with flow, compared to before. Then there's one other aspect to this change, and I've saved the biggest one in this section for last, by increasing the base hit points and shield toughness across the board to accommodate the now more sensible modding math, every single unranked Warframe is significantly tankier. Loki is the worst off, gaining only 34% effective hit points unranked, while the biggest winner is actually Inaros, with the Prime gaining 260% more effective hit points when unranked and unmodded compared to today. Across the roster, the average is a 140% increase in unranked, unmodded effective hit points, giving all low-level players especially a boost in survivability. This will mainly help when modding capacity is too low to be able to invest into defence. I've taken a bit of a detour here from the workshop information, but suffice to say, the modding is becoming more sensible and intuitive, frames which cannot use brief respite are either getting tankier or called an Aros, and unranked warframes are substantially more resilient for those still in the process of gearing them up. As mod values need to be adjusted to accommodate all this, D have outlined all of the other mods being affected one way or another. I don't need to mention them all, but four mods in particular stand out. Org Record and Boreal's Hatred, if they get the changes shown in the workshop, will be significantly buffed with the October update. Currently, Org Record gives plus 180% shield capacity, which on a frame like Excalibur will take him max ranked from 300 shields to 480. In the new update, which is also bringing max rank Excalibur to 370 max shields, the mod will provide a 70% shield hit point buff raising him to 629 shields. Org Record is going from being 40% the power of redirection to 70%. Likewise, Morial's Hatred is going from 34% of redirection to 65% of it. This is a substantial buff to these two mods, giving them more of a place in the meta, especially as both mods have survivability-based set effects. The other two mods I want to bring you to your attention are Vigor and Primed Vigor. Currently, these mods are a trap, offering a split of health and shields, but in poor quantities. Primed Vigor currently offers plus 220% health and shields, which is half the value of each of redirection and vitality. As extra shields are mostly a bad thing today, that doesn't help. The updated mods will see Normal Vigor providing the half and half value of plus 50% to each, while Primed Vigor is climbing to plus 75%. If you are using a universal damage reduction tank, such as Adaptation or Shatter Shield, this means that Prime Vigor can give you potentially 50% more effective hit points for the same mod slot as Redirectional Vitality. This is on top of the Enhanced Shield Resistance and Shield Gate you'll get compared to using only Vitality. Again, these two mods may have value now when choosing how to tank your Warframe. For Arcwings, the Stata mod changes are mostly neither here nor there, as mentioned in my recent Arcwing guide. None of the guidance I've given in that video will change, so let's move on. For Necromex, they're actually getting the opposite effect of the Warframes. As Necromex mods had much lower bonuses, the change means that a Necromex without max tank and energy mods will actually have lower values than before this update. You should really be using some of those mods anyway, as I covered in my Void Rig guide, but this is something to be aware of. A lesser modded Necromex will be a little bit weaker, while the maximum modding will be only as strong as before the update. Overall, I'm happy to take some sanity in modding and an easier time with unmaxed Warframes in exchange for a minor nerf to Necromex. Okay, sanity changes to mods aside, we can move on to the mission changes. The Carl missions have been given a boost to make them more interesting. Pure and simple, Carl moves faster, has loot radar and enemy radar. That's just a straight up benefit. Also, Carl will be able to pick up weapons from Fallen Brothers in the Junk Run and Prison Break missions to further add variety to the gameplay, including a mystery new shotgun specifically for Carl's use only. However, there is a note in here which I think misses the mark. Added to the Carl missions will be stock pickups to earn additional stock when you're out hunting for the hidden objects required for many of his mission objectives. These stock pickups are only two stock at a time, with five to be found for a max bonus of 10 stock a week. Personally, I feel that's a tiny amount and it doesn't address my issues with the objectives to scour the map for random hidden items. Hopefully the loot radar and enemy radar additions will improve on that process, but the bonus stock, at most 10 a run, 
feels about as impressive as the bonus credit for Tier 11 in the circuit. Beyond Carl, another mission getting a pass is the Archon Hunt, via changes to damage attenuation. This one, the devil is all in the details and will require testing, so I'll simply draw your attention to three things. One, maximum damage per hit is increased. Two, maximum damage per second is increased. Three, DE actively want to prevent one-shot Archon builds. Well, if they make that happen, then I can't fix that. But I promise you all now, I will try. I will investigate the new damage formulae when they arrive and see if I can find a one-shot for you post-update. I just can't guarantee success. I have reservations about damage attenuation to this extent. On the one hand, yes, it allows players of various gear levels to attend the same encounter and have similar experiences fighting the boss mechanics. On the other hand, why should various players with various gear levels have the same experience? If this change cannot be circumvented, then it basically means that once your weapon is able to hit the damage caps, you cannot improve on your build. We'll have to see just how low that limit is placed, but to throw out a random example, if a properly modded mid-game weapon is sufficient to hit the caps, then it devalues the investment you put into higher tier weaponry. More than anything, this is a symptom of the damage scaling in Warframe and just how ludicrous the bonuses we have access to really are. Effectively, when you enter an Archon mission, you'll be subject to a hidden timer for how long you need to shoot that Archon. That's what such strict damage attenuation does. It turns hit points into hit time. Beyond that, the tail end of this workshop includes a couple quality of life changes for late game content. One is that we'll actually be able to change Incarnum perks in the Arsenal again. Sorry not sorry Cavalero, I just don't like you placing divs on my stuff. The other adjustment is that you'll be able to select Rivens as a reward from the circuit on Steel Path instead of Incarnans, providing you have rank 9 opportunity. I would have preferred something more widely useful than Veiled Rivens, personally I would have picked Pathos Clamps, but it's still something. Seeing as these are quality of life improvements, let's use that to segue into the accessibility and HUD changes. Some of you can see enemies clearly and easily in all missions, and never accidentally shoot a Necros summon thinking it's an enemy, and that's fine. For everyone else, who finds Grenier blend in too well on the Zeraman, welcome to Entity Highlighting. You can select the colour and intensity, and toggle it separately for enemies, allies, and even your own character. It's purely accessibility, but accessibility is key in all aspects of life, including gaming, so I'm very happy D are including this. On that note, I'm also happy that D are including image and video captions in the forum post, which is another form of accessibility for screen readers especially. I don't need nor use them, but it proves D are thinking about the people who do. Thanks DE. Then, for conservation, we have quality of life changes, which can help everyone. The minimap already shows colour-coded icons for animal trails, but will now specifically filter to the closest one per animal. This arrives alongside easier waypointing, an easier time finding the trail start point, a minimap indicator of where the trail has reached so far, brighter trails to follow, checkpoint markers to help you keep on track, visual cues to indicate which direction an animal is coming from, audio and visual cues for how close the animal is, and the animals will gain the ally character highlight from the new highlighting system to help them stand out. All of that just makes it easier to see or hear what is going on. If you've got music playing, you no longer need to pause it to hear if the animal is responding and from which direction. The accessibility continues with auto melee, which really doesn't need much explanation. You hold down melee attack and you continue attacking. Simple as that. Glaives and Wolf's Edge will not get auto melee as they already have a hold melee mechanic, but everything else gets it by default. I cannot overstate how much of a benefit this is, as I get immensely tired of melee after even a few minutes of spamming E in a mission. Buffs. Not as in buffs being added to the game, but letting you know what buffs actually are. D are introducing the ability to hover over buffs in the pause menu to both see its name and see the description for what it actually does. I'm just going to say it. It's about time. Similarly, in the modding screen, if your weapon has a unique quirk or buff it provides, this will be listed there with technical information, rather than buried in a half-revealing description on the weapon itself. Again, clarity on what we've actually got. Brilliant. There's also a new update screen, but that one's self-explanatory, so I'm not going to discuss that any further. The fourth workshop dives into companion changes. D say they want companions to be viable in high level and be more interactive. Step one on that train, companions no longer die. Well, sorta. They still die, they just come back again 60 seconds later. 
If it can be revived today, you can revive it post-update, but DE are making that optional rather than required. It's death with benefits. All companions are also getting hit point and armor buffs. Biological companions will no longer need to level up to get full stats, effectively giving the unranked beast a five times or better EHP increase across the board. Hounds and mowers will be seeing absolutely wild increases to their effective tank, as much as an order of magnitude better health tank. All beasts will have around 100% more effective hit points on health with enhanced vitality, around 80% more effective hit points in shields with calculated redirection, and over 200% more effective hit points in health with both the health and armor mods, making link mods less mandatory. Sentinels are also getting huge bonuses, increasing shields by 100 to 200%, and health by 60 to 180 percent, ultimately granting it again multiple times more effective tank than before. This is alongside their new not quite dead state. Beyond the raw numbers, regen on sentinels now brings them back sooner rather than preventing death. Repair kit and medipet kit will heal companions faster. Accelerated deflection is available to all robotics rather than just sentinels, and also speeds up shield recharge delay. Various other mods are getting a shakeup too. Pack Leader has nerfed healing, but the exchange also adds Overguard to companions. Jin's Reawaken mod will now bring it back sooner, based on energy orbs picked up, granting you overshields on spawn based on the orbs attained. Spare parts has been changed from giving rare resources on Sentinel Death to marking enemies for additional loot periodically. Overall, companions will be more resilient and permanently available, which is great news all round. We're also getting some new companion mods soon, but the details are mostly under wraps. As much as some were previewed on the dev stream, I won't go into looking at those for now, as it's all heavily placeholder details. I'll bring that to you when it's a reality. Which brings us finally onto changes which will 90% only affect new players, but 10% will impact everyone. For the majority of people watching this video, it won't be as big a deal for you, more so for the friends you keep trying and failing to get into Warframe. First up, flawed mods are going. They're weak, they're mostly a waste of endo, they're being replaced with ordinary mods, a few of which are getting their drain reduced to make them easier to fit onto Warframes. This makes sense. Second, Mark 1 weapons are going, except they're not. They'll no longer be a reward from the tutorial quest, and will instead be available just through the arsenal. This means we'll now have to explain to new players why the next weapons they can buy after the tutorial are objectively worse variants of the tutorial weapons. Really, it's just because a surprising number of people are attached to the 8 former Mark I Bratton. This is one of those changes that makes some sense in detail, but from the outside just looks a little ridiculous. New players will also now be guided less towards just slapping on any random mod to meet the Venus Junction task, and instead will be guided towards completing Sire's Vigil and Voxelaris quest. The Voxelaris quest has been made noticeably easier to deal with how many players were getting absolutely stomped there. That's definitely a positive, especially as recently on stream I discovered a viewer who got to MR24 and never even achieved rank 1 with the Solaris after being beat down by the quest as a new player. Speaking of quest nerfing, Wave Rider is also going to be made easier by removing a bunch of challenges and focusing a little more on combat on the K-Drive. Frankly, less K-Driving is an absolute win, and there'll still be enough K-Driving in there to get used to how unusual you really will actually be to play once you unlock her. Lastly in this workshop are three universal changes of note. One, enemy radar is now innate with all Warframes getting 30 meters. I don't know if this will apply to operators too, but at the very least it means an easier time telling where the bad guys are actually hiding. Alongside the highlighting feature, I'm on board with this. Two, Caesar's Wisps will no longer float away and vanish when you get close to them, making farming for them as a clueless new player less off-putting. That's just a straight positive really, again, making looting in the looter shooter not be a frustrating experience. And three, Necromex. Farming for the parts is a pain, and also bugged. DE are addressing this by adding the broken part to the Necroloid shop for 2,500 standing. This is actually really cheap, and will seriously expedite anyone's farming process for getting a Necromex, which I am 100% on board with. This is just great. I'm not sure if there's a part of the game truly untouched by these five workshops. Quests, hit points, shield mechanics, companions, minimap, full map, visibility, abilities, body screens, and Carlin perks, circuit rewards, car missions. It really does feel like one of the most sweeping sets of updates ever, and this doesn't even touch on Dagath herself. 
I can say I'm seriously excited for the direction Warframe is taking, putting accessibility, sensibility, and sanity at the forefront of a lot of these alterations and adjustments. For now though, that's all the rambling I'm going to be doing on this topic. I hope you appreciate this dive into the workshops, and as always, buff access, nerf issues, and fight well, Tenno.